What's up, everyone? Welcome to Tidal Gardens. We are a coral farm in Copley, Ohio, and on this channel, we talk about all things reef tank related. In this video, we're going to take a look at trace elements. For us to continue to grow coral successfully, we need to pay close attention to our water chemistry. In practice, we routinely test for major elements such as calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, but we don't often test for trace elements. Now why is that? Are they not important? On the contrary, they are very important. So let's take a closer look. What are trace elements exactly, and what role do they play in our reefs? To put it simply, trace elements are elements that appear in very small quantities in salt water, literally trace amounts. They are vital to all sorts of biological processes, and due to the limited size of our aquariums, they can be depleted rapidly. In addition to being soaked up by the organisms in our tank, trace elements can be exported by protein skimmers and by chemical filtration. Adding trace elements is really easy. Trace elements can be replenished through regular water changes or with chemical additives. They can also be introduced from foods including amino acid supplements. It turns out that a lot of brands of amino acids don't just contain amino acids, they are bundled with trace elements. Similarly, chemical additives for major elements like two-part calcium and alkalinity often contain trace elements as well. Most of the time though, people can get by with just doing regular water changes, but a standalone trace element additive is also popular for those looking to supplement their levels. And that brings me to my next point. It is very easy to add trace elements, but before you run out and start dosing them, it's important to realize just how scarce they are in our reef. Let's take a look at the composition of salt water. Quick trivia question for you guys. What is the percentage of water in natural seawater with a specific gravity of about 1.025? Just the H2O portion, how much? 50%, 75%, 90%. Salt water with a specific gravity of 1.025 is made up of 96.5% water. That means the remaining 3.5% is the difference between fresh water and salt water. That portion is what we'll call sea salts. Let's take a closer look at that 3.5%. That 3.5% sea salt can be broken up into two main categories, major elements and trace elements. The major ions are chloride, sodium, no surprise there, right? Sulfur, magnesium, calcium, and potassium. You can see that the major elements comprise the vast majority of sea salts. If you were to remove these major elements from the mix, what's left is a whopping 0.2%. Remember, this is not 0.2% of the total composition of natural seawater. We are just talking about the 0.2% of that 3.5% that isn't literally H2O. In total, there are around 70 different trace elements in seawater, and all together make up that 0.2%. Now, I won't cover all 70, but I'll touch on the top 5 that come up frequently in fish tank discussions, just to give you some background. Let's start with iodine. Iodine is a trace element that has a long history of anecdotal observations attached to it. I've heard that it benefits soft corals, gorgonians, tunicates, sponges, and macroalgae, as well as molting invertebrates such as shrimp and crabs. Natural seawater has an iodine concentration of between 0.025 parts per million and 0.08 parts per million depending on the location. Iodine is an unstable element in the home aquarium and can take on multiple forms such as molecular iodine, iodide, or iodate. It's a toxic substance in its molecular iodine form, and this toxicity is why it's often used as an antiseptic dip. For example, 
Lugol's iodine solution, which is a very good antiseptic, is a mix of molecular iodine and iodide. We use it here regularly when we suspect a coral is having a bacteria-related issue. Iodine enters your system through salt mixes, feeding, particularly algae-based foods, and supplementation. Iodine can be removed from your system by protein skimmers, chemical filtration, algae scrubbing, and the organisms in the reef using it up through their normal biological processes. Now, you will get a lot of differing opinions about whether it's necessary to dose iodine in your aquarium. Most hobbyists believe that all organisms get their requirements met by regular water changes and feedings. My take on it is if you plan to dose iodine, it's important to test for it. That goes for every trace element, really. Blindly adding it can be problematic because trace element concentrations in levels higher than what's found in the ocean can be toxic, and we've already discussed that it doesn't take a lot to be higher than ocean concentrations. Having said that, testing can be a little tricky. Depending on what form iodine takes, it may or may not show up on a test kit. It's also not always clear what exactly a test kit is detecting. Some detect only one of the forms, while others detect a combination. The test kit that we have experience with is a Sailorfort test kit, which tests for both iodide and iodate. Another option is sending a water sample off to a lab and having it ICP tested. Next up, let's talk about iron. Iron concentrations in the ocean are super low. They are around 0 0.00006 parts per million. Iron plays a big role in a number of biological processes. In animals, it's used in oxygen transport. If you ever heard of hemoglobin in red blood cells, heme refers to iron, and thus hemoglobin is an iron-based molecule that's used to transport oxygen. In algae and corals, iron promotes photosynthetic activity. Now, photosynthesis splits carbon dioxide into carbon and oxygen, resulting in the simple sugar glucose and oxygen gas. This is a multi-step process and all along the way, there are electron transfers facilitated by iron. In the ocean, iron promotes photosynthetic activity in algae, both for zooxanthellae in corals and macroalgae. That's why sometimes you hear iron come up when hobbyists discuss algae filtration systems that rely on rapid growth and harvesting of that algae. The growth of algae in productive refugiums can strip out the trace quantities of iron in the water, and essentially the algae stops growing. Iron is looked at as a hard limiter on the growth of algae. We often associate growth and phosphate levels in the water. But a much more relevant measure is the iron content. You definitely don't want to overdo it though. While iron is not thought to be toxic to our aquarium inhabitants, when overdosed, it can lead to major algae issues. When iron levels get out of control, it's when you normally see catastrophic algae blooms in the reefs. The next trace element we can talk about is strontium. Strontium acts a lot like calcium in that it's taken in by stony corals in our reef tanks and incorporated into their aragonite skeletons. Some aquarists observed that adding strontium helped increase stony coral growth rates, but the jury is out on that. What we know for sure is that it happens, but it's unclear whether the incorporation of strontium into the skeleton is a good thing or not. It could be a positive mechanism to accelerate growth, but it could also be the coral trying to isolate a potentially toxic metal by depositing it in calcium carbonate. Strontium gets introduced mainly through salt mixes. Some brands of sea salt have doubled down on its possible beneficial effects and have chosen to formulate their product with elevated levels of strontium, so that's something to look out for. The next trace element is one that does not have a ton of research studies behind it, and it's frankly not something that was even on my radar until somewhat recently. This trace element is molybdenum. 
It is considered an essential trace element for both animal and plant health, as it plays an important role in the functioning of a number of enzymes, as well as chemical reactions involving nitrogen, carbon, and sulfur. So, in reef systems, molybdenum is thought to assist in the conversion of nitrate to nitrogen gas, as well as promoting the growth of zooxanthellae and corals. Like seemingly every other trace element on this list, there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. Molybdenum is toxic in high concentrations. The last trace element that I'm going to cover in this video is manganese. There was a study done in 2018 looking at the function of manganese in coral biology, and it appears to have something to do with the coral's ability to resist stress. In particular, it looked at whether corals bleached when stress was introduced, such as overheating. The study showed that the corals provided with manganese resisted bleaching, and the reason is thought to be manganese helps break down the formation of oxide radicals in the coral's body. It's, well, literally an antioxidant. The other effect that manganese had in corals is turbocharged photosynthesis in zooxanthellae. Manganese had been shown previously to improve the photosynthetic productivity of phytoplankton and algae, but it turns out it also does so in corals. In summary, trace elements are vitally important to all sorts of biological processes that happen in our aquariums. So the question remains, should reef aquarists be dosing trace elements regularly? I guess it depends on the uptake of trace elements by your reef's inhabitants and your frequency of water changes. Most modern salt mixes today have more trace elements than natural salt water, and in that sense have anticipated the uptake by the tank inhabitants. In most cases, a weekly 10% water change is more than enough to replenish these trace elements. It's possible, though, that heavily stocked tanks will deplete trace elements faster than sparsely stocked aquariums. In this situation, a trace element supplement could help you. My rule for dosing anything is pretty simple. Don't add any supplement that you are not testing for. It's important to know where your levels are before you start adding and to know where you should stop. Blindly adding, let's say, iodine because someone online said it was good for xenia, it's going to lead to some problems. Excess trace elements in concentrations substantially higher than natural salt levels can be toxic, and we already talked about the vanishingly small quantities that they represent in our salt water, so it doesn't take very much to overdose. Alright guys, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please give this video a like on your way out for the algorithm, and if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to this channel for more updates. Until next time, happy reefing.